Well, I am here to tell you that yes, his microphone was cut. The reason why Conor McGregor's microphone was cut was because when he made the comment, dance for me, boy, and then he followed it up with, yeah, dance for me, they didn't know where he was going with it. And for those of you that I'm pretty sure by now you know that it was a, a negative connotation to call an African-American man a boy back in post-reconstructive United States after the Civil War, post-slavery, whatever timeline you want to call it. And to this day, it's disrespectful to call any man a boy, but coming from a white man to another black man, very disrespectful, especially in these racially sensitive times. Now, personally, because a lot of folks have asked, you know, how do you feel about it? When he said it the first time, I said, okay, Connor, you need to hold up. You need to hold up. Look, because I get we're trying to sell tickets. And when you're trying to sell tickets and you're trying to sell pay-per-views, pretty much the only thing that you don't do is kick the elderly out of the chair, snatch a candy bar out the hand of a kid, or make jokes about the uh, handicapped and disabled. Outside of that, everything is fair game. And this is coming from someone who was a former fight promoter. So I know the depths of which you will go verbally to sell a ticket, but you have to be mindful of the times that we're in. And you have to exercise some sort of maturity in this because right now, it's not a good time for a lot of people that don't understand the historical ramifications of it or the historical reference to it and think it's a joke because that type of thing will get you laid out in a bar if you try to pull off what this guy's pulling off. So he said it the first time. I was like, okay, all right, whatever. You know, um, microphone cut, appropriate. I'm glad that they cut it so this thing doesn't escalate because that was on the line, not a flag on the play, but you're borderline. You caught yourself. In Toronto, which was the best stop of the May Mac tour, Toronto was one of those rare moments in time that you have when you're promoting a fight where just about everything you want to happen happens and it reaches a feverish pitch, but it doesn't go over the point to where the fans are turned off because you can piss people off and still sell tickets, but you can't sell tickets if you turn people off. And Toronto, it pissed them off, but it didn't turn them off. And I swear, in Toronto, they sold that whatever they were going to sell, that was it. They maxed out in Toronto. They ma like, that was it. If you weren't sold on this fight from when they were talking about it to the Staples Center, a large portion of casual fans bought it. I mean, the crowd was incensed. The, the roar, the enthusiasm, the ball bounced in the sky from the crowd, kind of hit it with a left hand, boom, right on point. He's on point. He knew what to expect. He called out Steven Espinoza. And knowing Steven Espinoza personally, he likes to shy away from the attention. So that was interesting to see how he handled it. Everything was on point. That's when it turned into a rap battle. That's when it turned into... Something else more than a, a boxing press tour, something more than a UFC press tour. Dana got into it. Leonard Eller Ellerby got into it. Floyd got into it. He started to become a little bit repetitive, but this was Connor's show. And we all know when he dropped that Ether ball, that ball of Ether with the book bag, which I'm not even going to repeat because everyone knows what it was. That was classic. That goes up there. That's going to be in the highlight package. Uh, the entire week leading up to the fight. That gives us something to talk about. So I gave that round to Connor 10-8 just for the simple fact that it didn't seem like Floyd was, was ready for that type of onslaught and the type of support that uh, Connor had. And then the thing about it was that when he grabbed the flag and Connor said, if you do something to that flag, I'm going, yeah, serious business. Floyd, Floyd didn't do anything with the flag. He didn't do anything with the flag. Uh, and the school bag became a prop, you know, the same way that your favorite wrestler used to carry the briefcase back in the day, that book bag is now the, uh, in, in Hollywood, 
they call it the, uh, the MacGuffin device, right? A MacGuffin device is used in uh, Alfred Hitchcock films. It's an inanimate object that is used to drive the narrative of whatever the presentation is, whatever the show is. So this bag symbolizes the money that Floyd Mayweather has defined himself by. So when McGregor opens that bag, takes a look in it and says, there's only five grand in here. Oh boy, you're in trouble. That kind of like breaks, it, 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 it almost breaks the image of what you have known Floyd Mayweather to be. And, and this entire press conference has broken some of the mystique of money Mayweather, whether it be the, uh, the, the letter from the IRS or the announcement that he has back taxes. We all know that he has the money to pay it back. We all know that he's going to make the money to pay them back two, three times over, especially after this fight. But it's not something you want out there. And I don't care who you are. The minute you get a letter or a notification from the IRS, the sleep every night after that is not the sleep that you got before you got the notification. Trust me on that. I don't care how much you have. That's something that you don't want. He said he's going to deal with it. His people are going to deal with it. But outside things have never affected Floyd's performance. So I don't expect it to, to, to affect his performance in a the fight. They came to Brooklyn. And this was, the, uh, whew, this was the event where I got backstage. And I got to see how everything was moving. I got to see and listen and hear uh, what the feedback was from the people that were putting together the event. And the people that were putting together the event, they were completely overwhelmed. There was a point in time where there weren't even enough security guards on staff to get to the stage when Connor's entourage went face to face with the money team bodyguards. And it was a it was a shit show backstage. But nonetheless, the fans in Brooklyn, they were out there and engaging the crowd. Now, it's a little bit different from where I was, my vantage point, but it sounded like the crowd was about 50-50.